Jason Twell, sometime plumber, odd job man and pub singer. Just the chance of a job in electronics was something to celebrate. I was um, very pleased that once I'd broken through the barrier, and I was also very pleased because I thought, oh, well, I just might be able to get a nice, decent job now in my field. This is the Lancashire firm that gave him the chance. They're called International Electronics. They make electronic weighing machines, and they're booming. But there's a problem. This sort of technology requires all kinds of highly skilled engineers and technicians, but they just can't find them. And it's not because people haven't applied. Managing Director David Gaskell. But the quality of the applicants really left one gasping in, in, in some instances. The basic lack of understanding of the fundamentals of electronics it takes your breath away. What kind of people were these? What kind of qualifications did they have? Oh, graduate engineers, um, people who got BSCs, in some cases even PhDs. They didn't know the basics? And they didn't know, didn't know the basics. Simple questions of circuit theory, uh, simple practical things. Thinking about his existing employees, David Gaskell realised that, like himself, most of them had first been interested in electronics as a hobby. It made him wonder whether that might be a better guide than paper qualifications. Which is what led to former plumber Jason Twell getting his big chance. Electronics had been his hobby for years, sometimes to his wife's despair. I don't get much done around the house from him. Um, he's permanently upstairs <laughs> working on these computers and trying new projects and things. Um, but uh, he has done a lot of good for our eldest son, Aaron, who is slightly dyslexic. 500 for the initial delay. And See, he's made a programme to go on the computer which flushes up numbers. And he has to try and write them all down. You might expect this kind of expertise to guarantee a job. But Jason had been out of work for four months and wasn't optimistic about his chances when he got through on the phone to David Gaskell. But eventually he got round to the six million dollar question and that was, what are your qualifications? Well, I thought, oh dear, this is it. Bang goes another possible job, you know, um, which has happened so many times in the past. You never get past the telephone stage. But much to my surprise, I told him quite forthright that uh, I didn't have any qualifications and uh, he went ahead and offered me an interview and I was thrilled to bit. He was extremely professional in what he did and this is a thing we don't often find in university graduates. Let me explain what I mean. If you're developing anything, be it a programme or a piece of electronics, you've got to document it properly because somebody else has got to be able to follow what you've done. And all too frequently, a graduate from university may do some quite good work, but a week after, no one can pick up what he's done. But Jason Twell, he was different. He came down here and he had a plastic bag from Sainsbury's, I think, in which he had programmes that he had written and examples of the printed circuitry that, that, that he had designed. And it was beautifully documented. The contrast with other supposedly qualified applicants has left the company in despair about the quality of university education. Marketing Director John Scarborough. We don't expect universities to turn out engineers who we can put in the lab and they will do it for a useful job of work from day one. What we don't expect to have to do is to take them on and spend three years training them before they can do anything. Are you really saying that it takes three years to train a graduate from a top university before he's any use to you? I'm saying if we had taken on some of the graduates who we've seen, that is very much the position we'd have been in. What's been the effect on the company of your recruitment problems? It did certainly delay the, the development of our, our new products and of course it's had an impact on earnings and, and profitability. Our problem is, is a crisis of skills, not a crisis of capital. So, a crisis of skills. But why? Is it just that small, out-of-the-way firms like this will always find it difficult to recruit the right kind of experts? Or is there something rather more worrying? 
Could it be that there's a shortage of skills anyway, despite mass unemployment, and a shortage that affects even the biggest firms? That's the alarming conclusion from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. They're very neat drawings. Where do you make them? In, uh, in Birmingham. Yeah. It, uh, it, 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 they refactor it. Avery's, the biggest name in this business. To test the National Institute's conclusions, we went to Birmingham, where Agriculture Minister Peter Walker was launching Avery's latest model, an electronic weighing machine they hope will soon be in every supermarket. Very good. You can't run over the Union Jack, my dear sir. <laughs> If the National Institute is right, the confident image of companies like Avery's disguises the same skills crisis that's hitting their smaller competitors. Managing Director Keith Hodgkinson. Finding the right skills are always a problem. It's particularly difficult for us now, especially when we're involved in so much new technology. In Avery's Birmingham factory, they began to face the problem two years ago. Till then, they were almost entirely dependent on traditional craftsmen. But then GEC took them over and everything changed. The old workforce was halved, the old mechanical designs replaced. Everything began to go electronic in what outsiders saw as a late attempt to save a fading company. But the success of this revolution depends on how quickly Avery's can find the extra technical staff they need. They've doubled the number of graduates in the company, but they're diplomatic about the quality of university output. Keith Hodgkinson again. We find that they turn out very bright and very able and capable people, but often not best suited for the demands of industry. The raw material is very good, but it does take us a long time to get the finished article. And in, 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 in times when technology changes so quickly, it's time that we can ill afford. How long does it take you to get the finished article? Well, it can vary from 12 months to three years, depending upon the, the, the particular area that we're dealing with. So it's almost another university degree that they're doing here? You could say that. But according to the National Institute, the engineering graduate problem is nothing compared to the skill crisis on the shop floor. Over 60% of production jobs here require skilled or semi-skilled operatives. There's also a whole new breed of workers to program and maintain the new computer-controlled equipment, like this automatic insertion machine. Automation has killed off hundreds of jobs here, but created many others that the company is struggling to fill. Avery's history of skill shortages is confirmed by works manager Phil Hart. We have, and particularly in the past, where you have seen in this department, we've got a lot of new products coming in. We found that there was no people available to work in this department. Surely this is just a technician level. No, it, it manifestly isn't. Throughout the whole of the manufacturing base that we have, we need to increase the level of technical competence and the, the amount of skill that we have. This is the transducer unit, and as you can see, once we take the four boards... Avery's are now spending half a million pounds a year to beat their skill problem. They run special classes for their service engineers. Okay. They have retraining programmes for their craftsmen, and they pay for special courses at the local technical college. But it's a symptom of the national attitude that other companies are cutting back on training. And colleges like this scrape around for decent facilities. There are about 900 students in Bill Haywood's engineering department. But they'll be lucky to get much of a training in computers. We've got six desktop and we've got three terminals which we can link into the mainframe computer at a local company. Do you think that's sufficient? No, it's not sufficient. One would like more, but uh, where does the money come from? Do you think industry should be helping more, providing these I machines? think industry uh, can tend to try to keep alive at the moment. A suicidal attitude given the latest evidence, because it's not just firms like Avery's which are being hit by a lack of skills. If anything, Avery's are better off than most. In other British industries, the skill crisis is even graver. It seems that man for man, the average British worker just isn't up to, say, the Germans. Anyway, that's the conclusion of this report from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. We were trying to find what were the real differences between the British situation and the European situation. Professor Price was concentrating on Germany's growing industrial lead. We were trying to find what were the main factors responsible for these differences in productivity. One of the biggest differences that we found, and it came as a surprise to many of us, was the importance that the Germans have for very long attached to vocational training. So how important for our productivity, for our industrial success or failure, is this difference in training? 
to my mind, this difference has become increasingly important, will continue to grow in importance as we come into a more technological world in which we have to produce goods that are made with precision and with reliability. Professor Price believes this difference in training is crucial in explaining another of his findings, that every country in Western Europe is stealing a lead on us industrially. In Germany, two-thirds of the workers are specifically qualified for the work they do. In Britain, it's the reverse. The majority are unskilled. Only one-third are qualified. But that's using criteria which may distort the findings in Britain's favour. Privately, they fear the position's actually worse. Maybe only 25% of British workers qualified, compared with 75% in Germany. And it's Britain's lack of skills, not the German abundance, that's unusual, says Professor Price. All the European countries are following the German pattern. I call it the German pattern. Uh, chronologically, you might say Switzerland was as far ahead as Germany was uh, 50 years ago, and so was uh, Holland. And I don't think you can really tell what is going on in British industry and the reasons for its crisis until you go to Germany and countries like that and see what they are doing in the course of their training and see what the impact of that has on the efficiency and reliability of the goods that they're able to produce. To explore just that, we went to Ballingen in southwest Germany, a town dominated by Beserber, the German equivalent of Avery's. Beserber is owned and run by a typical German industrial dynasty, a family called Kraut. They're very successful, with manufacturing plants all over the world. Like Avery's, Beserber is in the process of moving over to wholly electronic products. But unlike Avery's, it's avoided any redundancies so far. And the Kraut family believes that in the battle to hold on to and increase its share of the world market, the calibre of its workforce gives it the advantage. The quality of our products, that's the important thing. That's the success of our company. Managing Director Gunter Kraut. Yes, the quality depends on skilled workers. And we are happy that we have in this company more than 60% skilled workers. And that was the reason uh, for the success of our company in 116 years. Such is the Kraut family's commitment to training that despite the recession, the company is still spending a million pounds a year on it. Much of it on their own training school. We have in our house, uh, I think, a 100% training system. Uh, my father and me, uh, since uh, more than 50 years, uh, we spent in our company much money for the training system because uh, I, I told about the philosophy. We think that uh, uh, after the training you have uh, good skilled workers. To have a training system uh, you have success. The same philosophy is embodied in the national system. Most German youngsters leave school at 16, but by law must then follow three years of vocational training. They can only work for employers who have qualified teachers on their payroll and even then must attend college at least one day a week. Beserber's youngsters attend a typical local college. It would be a showpiece in Britain. Every profession or trade is covered here, from engineering to bricklaying, or even painting and decorating. No one can call themselves qualified until they've passed the examinations at the end of their course. The system, which even provides courses for unskilled workers, is controlled by employers and unions working together. In general, you can see that the system is very well. We have here in Germany the dual system, state, school, and here uh, the, the factories. And uh, if you have problems... Both the training. Both the training. We speak about it with the state. And uh, I think uh, we have now a good system, but you must each year uh, to try to make it better. That's very important. We don't say we have the best system. We have a good system and each year you, you, we must try to make it better. One criticism is that the system's too effective. According to some economists, it's producing a workforce which is, if anything, overqualified. Well, firms like Beserba aren't grumbling. The system produces exactly what they want and they're happy. So why is it so different for their British counterparts I blame the educational system, and I blame it at all levels, right up through the primary school, the secondary school, and most outstandingly, in our particular difficulties, the universities. Back in Lancashire, David Gaskell of International Electronics echoes the gut feeling of so many industrialists. 
including fellow director John Scarborough. The majority of people in the teaching profession, whether it be primary, secondary or university teaching, have had no industrial experience. They've gone the round of school, university and back to school again. Uh, and certainly my experience suggests that these people are very ignorant of what industry has to offer as a career. Um, and to an extent, through that ignorance, they, they, they discourage people from going into it. Yes, there are tremendous skills. Lou Hodgkinson is the company's works manager. Um, a tremendous amount of time in the early stages of training is taken in convincing the trainees that they are capable of actually doing the job. When your average operative comes here from school, do they know anything about industry? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Um, and really, this... The six months, I think, of the training is taken up in acclimatising to, to industry in general. Just two miles away, the local grammar school in Rossendale offers some clues as to why they need to be acclimatised. Outwardly, at least, they're not exactly geared to the needs of modern industry. Grumio e willa contendi. Clemens grumio nem In this school, though, nothing is as simple as it looks. It was, in fact, one of the first grammar schools to set up a technical department. Can you just withdraw the drill and let me have a look, stop the machine and let me have a look at the knurling? The department's been going for 30 years, but it's hardly been a roaring success, as headmaster Philip Clark explains. You will find that parents don't want their sons and daughters to go into local industry, and this colours attitudes very strongly. Uh, for instance, quite recently, I had a, a mother come in about a boy who was not working too well in school, a boy of about 14 years of age. And when we discussed the reasons why he probably wasn't working very hard, she said, um, well, I've told him, I've told him, if he doesn't work in this school, he's going to go in the slipper trade like me, me and his dad. And I think really this, to a large extent, epitomises attitudes of Rossendale parents even to this day, that they want their sons and daughters to get into respectable professions. Uh, there's still very strong feelings along these lines, I think. Even some teachers have shown the same bias, says the head of technical studies, Austin Witt. Just occasionally, but obviously, even in, uh, school. Even in this school in the past, we've had certain bias. Um, I remember on one occasion when, when we had a very, very good A-level group. Uh, there were half a dozen of them. They all got distinctions at A-level, and I was feeling very pleased, of course. But one member of staff commented and said they shouldn't be doing these subjects in a grammar school. Nor, it seems, are they doing the subject industry is most desperate to push, electronics. In 1970, this school became one of the first to offer an A-level course in this subject. Science head John Timperley explains why few of their better pupils will take it. Well, many of them find that uh, when they apply to a university, the university doesn't really want to know. They much sooner have physics and maths, and word tends to spread that uh, A-level electronic systems, well, it's not a good subject. And why don't the universities rate it as a useful A level? That we haven't discovered. A lot of them, I think, don't know anything about it. It doesn't concentrate on the theoretical aspects. It's how one uses these devices, how one puts the things together and obtains something which works, which is, I think, much more useful nowadays. Uh, from our inquiries, uh, electrical engineering and electronics departments of university would welcome it. But the university general requirement uh, will, not st will still not accept it. So the university hierarchy, the old establishment it's really, of the It's really the old establishment, yes, of the northern universities who will not accept electronics and probably kindred subjects as acceptable as a matriculation requirement for admission to university. Do you think this reflects the same cultural bias against manufacturing or industry that you, say, you can see amongst parents in the valley? I think to some extent it does, yes. With only a handful of pupils doing electronics A-level, what sort of future has this subject? One really wonders whether we can afford to continue to staff and equip the teaching of electronics in the sixth form in schools. So you may stop it? It's possible that we may, yes. The more modern side of British schooling seems just as uncertain and confused. At the local comprehensive, they go all out to encourage technical education, but they feel they can't win. The headmaster, Richard Marshall. Well, I think morale is rather low, to put it <laughs> mildly, in the teaching profession at the moment. Um, we are criticised from all sides. Obviously, for a lot of the evils of society itself and the behaviour problems outside and so on are attributed to teachers. 
But I think more perhaps um, are these criticisms that what we're doing isn't relevant, which we're very aware of. Teachers do feel at the moment their whole raison d'etre is being questioned. And of course we're questioning it ourselves when we see that the end product for so many of our youngsters is unemployment. Neither teachers nor industrialists seem prepared to shoulder the blame for Britain's shortage of technical skills. 900 miles away in Germany, there's another school, another set of teachers and another set of attitudes. This is the technical department in the school next door to Beserber. German schools today rarely teach woodwork or metalwork as such. They think that's old-fashioned. Instead, everybody is taught a subject they call technic. Neither art nor science, but equal in prestige to both. It teaches the skills and understanding British employers say are missing in our school children. And there's no confusion among German teachers as to why it's taught. This is a very important subject. This has to be done because we live from that. And what do you live from that? What do you mean? What I mean is that only our knowledge in science and techniques can help us to survive because we are a country without vast mineral resources or we have no oil or petrol, you see. So we can only live when we have a high technical standard and bring good products which we can sell on the world market. And you think that's the crucial reason for Germany's success? Oh, yes. That's the point. And I think our future depends on that. So we have to work hard in those subjects. The only thing we can export in the next 20 years. Is your skills? Yes, and our technical knowledge. Of all the European countries, it's only in Britain, it seems, right, that the so education system has different priorities from those in Germany. Clement starts to speak. Bye-bye. STB toga splendida. Yet even the bitterest critics of the British education system accept that it's unfair to blame the schools alone. The problem goes far deeper. Even in this day and age, there is an anti-industrial bias in society. Um, and people think that a better career than making things, than generating the wealth that this country needs, is to go into the, the, the service industries. All right, they're, they're essential. I'm not denying that for a moment. But the reputation that industry has means that far too many of the brighter brains in this country are diverted into channels other than industry. Given the situation we're in at the moment, it's obviously going to be a very long job before we get it right. Uh, we've got to survive in the meantime, unfortunately, as has the rest of British industry. Uh, and uh, all one can see at present is that we are going to get further and further behind the Japanese and the Germans. German par excellence, champion home in chicken fancier for nigh on 13 years, and all.